What happens in the sky affects life down here on Earth. The celestial compass shows you how and guides your way with astrology you can use from professional astrologer Kathy Beale. Every episode features her light-hearted practical forecasts and navigational tips, blended with humor, optimism, and a love of patterns, symbolism, and pop culture references. Kathy translates technicalities into concepts that apply to real life. You'll learn how the current moment ties to where we've been, from the recent past to cycles that last happened years ago, and get a look at where we're heading. And much more, from special topics to special guests. The Celestial Compass. Enlightening, entertaining, and empowering. Here's your host, Kathy Beale. Greetings, Earthlings. This is Kathy Beale of EmpowermentUnlimited.net, your host for Celestial Compass. We have a provocative and entertaining topic for today. Can astrology give information about past lives? But first, a brief forecast for the month of May. Uh, we're all over the map in May. You're already noticing, I'm sure, a shift in the energy. In many ways, it is extremely active with people feeling like they want to be out and about and getting in touch with lots of people, doing many, many things. There's a sense of being released from cabin fever and making up for a lot of lost time. It could be very, very fun with a number of bodies moving into Gemini, which I call short attention span theater. It's really good for multitasking and for um, darting from one thing to another, being very, very flexible, and also finding the humor in whatever is going on. At the same time, there are a couple of influences that uh, – take us backward, that slow us down ever so slowly and imperceptibly. Mercury is gradually moving toward his next retrograde of the year, which begins at the end of the month. Saturn will retrograde before then, and he's bearing down on the spot where he will be for the next Saturn-Uranus square, which is exact next month. This is stress testing our uh, communities, our networks, our use of technology, the new constructs that moved into place in our lives, in our society, in our world at the December solstice. And while this is all going on, there is additionally a sense or a taste of things to come. So we will feel like we're in many spots of the time space continuum all at once. A little bit of hovering in the here and now, a little bit of going back over old territory, that which will be particularly strong once Mercury goes retrograde, but also a taste of what's to come next year when Jupiter, the planet of expansion and beneficence and somewhat boundlessness, enters the sign of Pisces on the 20th. It's going to hang out there into July and then duck back and finish its year in Aquarius. But we're getting kind of like a an initial, a coming attractions trailer of what part of the vibe will be like next year when Jupiter heads into Pisces for well and true. And you can look back 12 years and get a sense of what was expanding in the way you were looking at things. Uh, Jupiter at this point will be in the same sign as the ruler of Pisces, Neptune, which is absolute boundlessness and transcendence. So you could have optimistic faith and run around singing tomorrow from Annie, regardless of what is going on in your life. And for more about this, look at my forecast for the month of May, which you can find at Ohm Times and also at my site, empowermentunlimited.net. And now for the meat. Our guest today is my friend and colleague, 
Andrew Brewer. He is a clairvoyant, an astrologer, and a past life reader and researcher. He's the author of 10 books, and he has been listed in over 30 publications as one of the top 50 psychics in the world, one of the top 100 light workers in the world, and one of the top 30 psychics in the United States. He has been studying reincarnation and past lives for more than 40 years. Andrew has published many prospective past life matches, some for celebrities and some for himself. And for more information about this, visit his site, andrew-brewer.com. Welcome, Andy. Kathy, thank you. Good to be here. You're thank all- you very much for inviting me. Uh, I'd like to start with a question I have not asked you yet, which is, how did you get into astrology? I think most people get into astrology because they're confused about themselves and they look for ways to try to give them a clue as to who they are and what they can do. So I started doing astrology that way when I was in my early 20s and uh, just got progressively more and more interested in it. And then when the past life thing kind of concurrently happened for me in my early 20s, I guess my early 20s is when my life changed me dramatically. I just kept at it and kept at it and kept at it. And, you know, it's you know, it's a fascinating thing to study. And I wanted to understand relationships with myself. And eventually I figured out a way to check out if, if I was going on a date, how I would get along with this person. And I started, you know, I just kind of went from there. But initially I was confused. I got so confused, you know, all these years later. But that was why I started Interesting. And did you, was this self-study? Did you study with teachers, gurus, just being an Aquarian? I'll bust you in that regard. Did you just figure it out on your own? <laughs> I pretty much, well, I mean, I, I read a lot of books. I initially started with Alan Oaken, a book that was super important to me early on that had just come out when I was a young guy with Astrology, Karma, and Transformation by Stephen Royo. I read Steve Forrest's book. And, uh, and I tried to piece it together. Initially, I think, you know, most people look at astrology and this is a cookbook mentality, which is just overwhelming. But ultimately, I, I got a sense of it, and I began to make up my own ways of doing astrology, much more evolutionary type of astrologer. If I hadn't been such a bozo, I would have met Dane Rujar back in the day. But, um, so, you know, I just was uh, ultimately... You know, I kind of went more as a clairvoyant, but I used astrology uh, as a way. I really primarily use it in, in terms of dentistry now more than anything else. I look at relationships between people. I think astrology really is a very good tool for seeing how people are likely to meld together. So. And we'll come okay. back to that in a second because I can see where that is where that is leading. Uh, but another foundation piece here. So how did your interest in past life research develop? You say it was around the same time. So I was one of those little kids, but I was in the 1950s that saw stuff as a little boy. And of course, in the 1950s, Bridie Murphy or no Bridie Murphy, that was not really something that went talked about too much. So I had these images in my head and it just confused me a lot. All these things just confused me. And I tried to understand why these things in my head were there. And so I went to California. I went to California to be an actor, but I ended up being, you know, doing these other things. And I tried to understand why I kept seeing stuff and what, if it meant anything. And that's how I started with past life impressions. And I went to a bunch of psychics in San Francisco. And I was sort of a psychic prodigy. When I was in my early 20s, almost like within a year, crazy. And, and so for me, past lives became a defining piece of my life in that I wanted, you know, like you know, my father died right in front of me when I was 22. I think that had an impact on me that probably was, was brought in with it. A lot of people in my life died. I had a girlfriend who died in her 20s. And, uh, so, so death was a big part of my life when I was young, and I think all those things combined to give me 
sense of like, well, what's the point? What happens? What happens when we die? What do we do? Why are we here? And, and that was the initial catalyst. And then it just went. He just went from there. Okay, so now um, my understanding of your um, process is that it doesn't start with astrology. It starts with an energetic read. Would that be accurate? And then you use astrology to test what you're getting? Yes. That, Can you that, talk that's some what... about what... Okay. Can you talk some about how, how your process works? Let's say you would have a person cross your mind. You've done um, some analyses of people who are prominent now in the news now, and we'll talk about one of them in a minute. But so something would, would get your attention, and then what would you do? So initially what would happen is I would think about someone, and I would have images pop in my head. And then I would try to basically trick the computer into giving me a picture that would correspond to the story in my house. So then I would do a photo analysis. I would have to, like the photos light up to me. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of like a backlight. It's hard to explain. It sounds crazy. But it's like the photos light up. So once I have the photo and I have my people, then... I look at them, I think about them as a clairvoyant, and once I've gone through whatever my little process is, I also do photo where I take the photos and stack them on top of each other because I do think there's a biometric. I think past lives look alike. Once I've done so, those things, then I do the astrology to try to test. Astrology is like the final frontier. If they okay. look the same and everything matches, but their astrology is wonky, then I throw them out. So let's back up just just a second here. So you you get a you get a feeling about an individual, and then how do you link? Maybe there's no way you can describe this part of the process. How do you link a specific person to a prior life? Usually, what happens is that I will think about a person, and details of the other life comes to me. And so if they give me storyline. So then what I try to do is take that storyline, try to condense it, and then I search for somebody that matches the story in my head. If I find people that match my story, then usually I can get information about them. Then I look at their photos, and then hopefully I have their birthdays, and then I can compare their charts. But the initial is, I guess you would say, uh, a clairvoyant vision or something pops in my head. The person I'm looking for is this, 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 and this. Then I look for somebody who is this, 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 and this. Then I look at their photos. If their photos match and they match my story, then I start paying attention. And there are specific types of aspects that you focus on in synastry, synastry being the comparison between two charts, how two charts charts interact with each other. Um, there are two, right? There are two that you look at, or why don't you? Why don't you tell me what what particular aspects do you look at? It's not like does it look like the same person in astrologically? That's a very different thing. If not even quite like does it look like this person would get along with this other person? You have what are what are the aspects that you types of aspects? So what you're I'm looking, looking for. for are very very tight orders. I'm looking for this planet has the same degree measure as some other planet. I mean that's the first part. So what I'm looking at is let's say that somebody's sun is exactly conjunct somebody else's the other person's Mars, or their Pluto is conjunct their Saturn, or their and if you, have the, if you have the time and you can do the moon, the moon's really important. But you don't always have the moon. But if you have the moon, the moon connects to the nodes, or the moon connects to you. So I'm looking for, for initially, I'm looking for conjunction. The and three really things tight ones. That I, okay. Really okay. tight ones. I mean, I'm super you know, meticulous in terms of the orbs as an astrologer. So, like, 
my let's see, my natal Mars is 16 area. If somebody says, oh, my Venus is conjunct your Mars and it's five Aries, I go, well, I don't think so. If it's 15 Aries, then I'll pay attention to it. So to me, it's like a two, three degree max. Anything over three or four degrees, I sort of throw out as not being part of my uh, analytic. So, so I'm looking really, I don't mean to be so astrology geeky here, but I'm looking for super tight degree measures first. In order, the things that I pay attention to are going to be conjunctions, the coin conks, 150 degrees, and then the opposition. Those are my three primary ones. Sometimes the squares, maybe. Sometimes the trines, maybe. But it really is those three. Zero, 150, 180. And, so and we're going to, we're going to, I'm sorry. Finish your, no, go ahead. Uh, and then we're going to take a break. I was just going to say, we'll go into those second and third types of aspects uh, in more detail in the next section. But right now, we're coming up on our first break. So we'll be back in a few minutes. The cutting edge of Conscious Radio, Ohm Times Radio, IOM FM. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the Internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. Ohm Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single Ohm Times endeavor. Host your show with Ohm Times Radio Network. Life is a flow, and enlightenment is simply harmonizing with the way life really is. Then you find that life is effortless, benevolent, and free of all suffering. Hey everyone, this is G.P. Walsh, and I want to invite you to my brand new radio show that's launching right here on Home Times Radio called The Flow of Enlightenment. I've been a spiritual teacher for decades, and my greatest pleasure is being able to share with you these deep and highly practical spiritual ideas. So join me in The Flow every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern, and let yourself be transformed. Want help with your own celestial compass? Visit my site, empowermentunlimited.net, for Astro Insight forecasts for each week, month, and new and full moon. Want to explore the personal impact? Make a decision? Understand another person? (laughs) It is possible. Click the Services tab to book a personal session with me. That address again, empowermentunlimited.net. Coping 19, brought to you by CDC and the Ad Council. If you're feeling increasingly lonely right now, you're not alone. It's totally normal. Even though we may not be able to get together in person, connecting virtually with friends and family still gives you a chance to interact with people and may help raise your spirits. Join a virtual book club, set up group text chats, or online video coffee breaks with coworkers. Find more self-care and coping tips at coping-19.org. Welcome back to Celestial Compass. We're talking to Andrew Brewer about how he uses astrology in his past life research. Just before the break, you said there are basically three different factors you look at when you're examining two charts. One is a tight conjunction or tight conjunctions. The second was in conjuncts. Now, that's kind of unusual because when I was first learning astrology this was not this is not one of the major ptolemaic aspects it's not something that years ago was paid a lot of attention to uh and it has this weird dynamic the symbol looks like a seesaw and it's often described as an aspect of adjustment how did you identify this as an indicator of a connection between two people I think it was Gene Avery or somebody first mentioned it years and years ago. I forget where the, the idea of person was. But I find that that aspect seems to be significant to me. And so when I look at 
the conjunctions are easy, right? You can look at a conjunction, the oppositions are easy. The in conjunct, the twin conjunct is complicated because your brain doesn't normally think about it. So what I've done for me and for other people who are trying to do this is what I do is look at the degree measure. And what I want to do visually is to look at everything, all the numbers that are close together. So if you have two planets that are 23 degrees, I'm going to look at them and try to figure out what the relationship is. Because they're going to have some kind of relationship. Mm-hmm. And, and so to me, the degree measure are more important almost than the aspect. So if you think about past lives, for a past life to have an influence, there has, just like with astrology, we can look at astrology and say, is astrology reflective of something or is it determinant? It's the same kind of thing with past lives. So is, is the past life leading us towards a certain kind of action? Or is it reflective of a certain kind of state of being? So to translate that into English, there has to be some way that we connect with a a core essence. And and so we look at that essence as a way that determines how we process information, like a template. I say that consciousness is non-local, like we connect to it, like a radio signal, like your past life is in Google Cloud. I use this analogy in the past. And, and so we have a certain kind of, you know, URL or IP address for your past life. And so the degree measures become super, super, super important to me. And that we want to be on the same bottom dial. And that's why I initially look at the degree measure first and foremost before I worry about the aspects. And I'm wondering, that. no, that makes that makes absolute sense because de- degrees do s- jump out at people. And I have found that blood relatives often have a sector of the zodiac where everybody has something um, around the same sign in the same degree. And it would make sense to me that this would uh, go for other aspects of a soul that you might be part of or a personality that might be kin to yours. But I find the in conjunct really interesting because there's something that doesn't flow from that. There is a a shifting that needs to happen between one person. If two people's mercuries are in conjunct, the way they go about communicating doesn't automatically flow. They have to make allowances for the other person in order to get their point across. Um, Which I think is a really brilliant way of expressing it. So if you look at a past life, these theories of past lives, they have to find some way to assert their influence, yet there's a disconnect between I'm going to completely different body and immediate history, uh-huh. yet these influences are somehow trying to permeate my consciousness. I think that the evolution is that we come with an emotional template. I think that your past life, your past lives collectively are going to have certain kind of similarity, uh, both a physical similarity, uh, vocational similarity, but especially an emotional similarity. So if you look at the emotions as something behavior, then the the in conjunct, I think, really speaks to that because, you know, I'm trying to figure out what these weird impulses are. Why did I spend 42 years trying to figure this out, right? These weird impulses, and I think the in conjunct, because it's kind of like off filter a little bit, really makes sense to me because these lifetimes are part of me, yet they're also separate from me, and how do I integrate them? Like, you know, I'm schizophrenic here. How do I bring all these disparate parts into some sort of cohesive, you know, consciously controlled way of interacting with the world? So, so to me, the in conjunct is, is number two on my hit list. So how does the opposition fit into that? When there are two placements that are really tightly opposite each other, it, does that have something to do with getting a different vantage point? 
I, I I'm just spitballing here. Well, how does how did you identify yeah, yeah. that, or did you just see that lining up in a number of the things you came up with? So, for, so for me, I don't look at virology. Even though I'm using spinistry here, I don't look at it like I would if I was comparing two romantic partners. What I'm looking at is do the relationships seem significant? Are there commonalities? You know, you oftentimes will see oppositions with the moon and you'll see oppositions with Pluto. Uh, and so if you look at other points in the astrology that are very important to me, again, if I have the time, are the vertex and the anti vertex. And, uh, and also uh, Lilith. So, so I pay attention to those too. I mean, my process, astrology, is, is in some sense a minor piece to, to my process. It's really kind of 20% of it, but it is the ultimate glue. And, and again, for me, Kathy, if the astrology doesn't, if there aren't a lot of tight aspects, inner aspects between the two, then in my theory, how it would operate, to me, I throw them out. No matter... If they're identical twins and the story's not and everything else, if I can't find anything between them, you know, after like fine tooth comb, then I, I think that there is not enough uh, symmetry between them to warrant saying, yeah, I think you were this person 75 years ago. And how would someone make use of this kind of information? Like so, if someone if someone feels a resonance with another person, then you start playing with the photos and and putting them side by side and actually starting to overlap them, and then you see well, there's some really tight links between this chart. Does it help someone make more sense of their current life? It could again, again in this particular case of Kathy, the astrology is more like a uh, is like an audit sheet after the fact. So if you look right. at soulmate. So if we look at astrology and soulmate, again, we could do studies through the same kind of thing that I might do in trying to do, use it as a confirmation for a past life. would be the same thing. Is this a soulmate relationship? Is this relationship likely to be significant? Soulmates can be good or bad, but they're important. They're impactful. And so the degree measures for me are about impact. They're about magnitude. And so that's why I have such a I, so I look at the inner aspects of being so important to be tight, tight, because we're looking at levels of magnitude. Yeah, you're nice, but I'm sort of over you, or I've thought about you for you know, 30 years. A lot, of we, a lot of times we can see that uh, in terms of the uh, intensity. Um, so let's, let's put this into something people let's let's give an example here one of the ones that caught my eye early on that you did involved billy eilish can you take us through that process so it's interesting you bring up billy eilish you just brought this up to me about two minutes before we went on so i actually looked up what i wrote about it at the time and the reason i did this about billy eilish is you asked me if she was somebody else i said i don't think so so initially <laughs> oh, that's, so that's the back so when i started thinking about billy eilish because people ask me, you and actually some other people ask me, I'm going to figure this out because I'm I thought about it and, I, and what popped in my head, so this is the magical unicorn part, was that she was a reincarnation of a really famous musician, but someone who died in 1998. Now, there is no astrology that would tell you that. That's just sort of like an extra piece of whatever process I have. So I went with the idea Okay, I'm going to look for musicians who died in 1998. And the very first name on that list was somebody you may have heard of. His name was Frank Sinatra. Well, most people, I think, are going to look at Billy Irons and go, Frank Sinatra, dude, you're like, hi. So then I started looking at the picture of them. And I've done the photo overlays. And the photo overlays are really freaky because there's a very strong physical commonality. So I thought, wow, you know that's kind of weird, but then I kept going with it. 
So then once I went past and I did my photo overlay, photo overlay is super, super tight. If you compare them, like if you look at the photos I've done, they're really like incredibly close in terms of, of the basic facial architecture. And even some of the photos, there's a symmetry to the photos. It's like, it's like the photo itself, the way they're staged, you know, this again gets into causality. Why is it like that? These are chronological questions out of my pay grade. But we tend, we tend to see in past lives a sort of a weirdness to the angles of the photos. So then, uh, see where you are. Well, so, let me, we let me pause you for a second here. Sure. Uh, pause you for a second here. Now, for people who are having trouble visualizing this. Initially, what you would do with photos or what you have started with is you would take one side of one person's face and meld it with the opposite side of the other person's face. Yes. I would straight, slice straight them in down. half. I would slice them in half and stick the two halves together and see if they if the nose matched, the smile matched, the eyes matched, if the face was the same size. Then... Ultimately, I began to go, well, you know, this is good, but let's, let's rev this up a little bit. So I started taking the photo and a process where I would plop it right down on top of the other photo, and then I would do a transparency. And so then I would look at it, and if you kind of slide the transparency zero to 100, it's really kind of a freaky process, but people don't see that process. So what I'm looking for are, do these people look like they're related there should be a family resemblance. These should be kiss and cousins that look a lot alike. And, and in my opinion, Billy Eilish and Frank Sinatra in this process pass that test. They also have a very strong, you know, obvious talent. You look at musicians, musicians tend to, in my experience with it, in whatever way you want to catalog that, musicians like to come back as musicians. And musical ability also seems to be a very unique skill set. I think more unique at a high-end level than being a psychic or probably anything else. Excuse me. So that was, so I had Billy, then I had Frank, and I thought, oh my God, I'm sick crazy stuff already. If I say Billy Eilish, it's reincarnation of Frank Sinatra and just add to the, the madness associated with me. But then I looked at it, and then I did the astrology. And I actually went because okay. I looked up what I initially wrote about it. So I have all the astrology, bam, 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 laid out and what they were. And, but, so for, for people like you, what's going on with you? What I do is I have an impression first. Like, um, like an angel told me, or however you want to look at it. I have a vision in my head. Then I try to find a candidate who matches my vision. Then I stick them side by side. I go slice their photos in half and, and basically glue them together in PowerPoint. And then I go try to find their birthdays and pray that they have birth time. And they went to the So that's how I do it. So what were some things that jumped out in the sinistry between Billie Eilish and Frank Sinatra? Do you have that at your disposal? I do. So I'm going to quote myself here. I'm going to kind of paraphrase what I have. So Frank's north node is 10 Aquarius. He has a conjunction in his natal start of the north node at 10 Aquarius with Uranus at 12 Aquarius. Billy Eilish's moon is 12 Aquarius. And she, so this makes it exactly conjunct Frank's Uranus. I guess I should try to like the front date. But it also means that the moon and the moon node are conjunct. This has already gotten my attention. Also, Billy, and I normally wouldn't count this too much, but because it's the moon, uh, her Neptune is seven Aquarius. So the seven Aquarius ties in with Frank's north node at 10. Then we go, what else do we have? They were both born, they are both Sagittarians, they were both born the same week, only 86 years. So Billy's son is 26 Sagittarius. Her south node is 27 Sagittarius. So she has a conjunction of, you know, her, her south node and her son. This makes a trine 
to Frank's Mars at 27 Leo. Frank's Pluto is two Cancer, and this opposes Billy's Mercury at four Capricorn and her Chiron, which is at zero Capricorn. So there's a two degree window. Billy's Pluto is 15 Sagittarius. So, so to try to, and I'm going to, I should probably stop here if you need to take a break, but I'll say this real quickly. Pluto and moon aspects sort of scream karma to me in ways that the other things mm-hmm. don't. And also aspects to the moon nodes, and if you have it, to the vertex too. And the anti vertex. So, I'll, I'll well, Pluto can be. Well, we've got a we've got a, a couple of seconds here. So Pluto can be an uh, an indicator of karma or things coming from the deep past or some kind of ancestral line. Right. I think Pluto is 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 indicative of things that are disrupting. I think Pluto likes to shake and bake. And so ah. again, with the idea that being you know, Frank Sinatra is kind of a disruption to me, if that energy is behind what I'm doing. That's the way I want people to look at the, the synastry of Pluto and the nodes is that, and the in conjunct, is that there's a disruptive element to it. You're trying to integrate this. If you can bring two things together, you have a lot more power. But if you have two horses running opposite ends of the corral, then you've you got a little bit of a problem. And hold that thought. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes after our next break. Bringing a more conscious lifestyle to your world. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Ohm Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. How would you like navigational tools you can use on your own? Visit my site, empowermentunlimited.net, and click the Shop tab. There you'll find lots of talks and guides explaining the big influences at work now, like Saturn in Aquarius and Uranus in Taurus. You'll also find a variety of guided visualizations for relaxing, clearing your energy, or getting to know planetary archetypes. That address again, empowermentunlimited.net. Grab a cup of tea or a glass of wine and tune in for Inspired Conversations with publisher Linda Joy on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. Linda creates sacred space for leading female luminaries, empowering authors, heart-centered female entrepreneurs, coaches, and healers. A soulful venue where guests openly share the fears and obstacles they've overcome, wisdom and lessons learned, and the personal journey that led them to the transformational work they do in the world. Inspired conversations to empower you on your path to authentic, soulful living. If I could be you, and you could be me, for just one hour, if you could find a way to get inside each other's mind, walk a mile in my shoes, walk a mile in my shoes, walk Walk a mile mile in my my shoes. shoes. We've all felt left out, and for some, that feeling lasts more than a moment. We can change that. Learn how at belongingbeginswithus.org, brought to you by the Ad Council. Walk a mile in my shoes. Welcome back to Celestial Compass. Today we're talking about astrology and past life research with Andrew Brewer. Now, something jumped out at me when you were talking about some of the links between the charts of Billie Eilish and Frank Sinatra, and that was the specific degrees that link them in Aquarius. And the reason that got my attention is that Saturn is currently traveling across those degrees while he's uh, 
uh, squaring Uranus multiple times this year. The second square in June is at 13, and the one in December is at 11. So wouldn't we expect to see them both in the news somehow this year with this? I would expect Billy's going to be in the news anyway, but yes, I would think that that would be significant. And, um, you know, I noticed that too when I just, again, I hadn't thought about Billy Eilish until you mentioned it before you go. Another thing jumped out at me is that I want to say this about Mercury. You have two people that we would think of as throat chakra dominant people, communicators, performers, who not only are super talented musicians, but they transcend that. Each of them is a celebrity, and that has its own sort of... And so the relationship between their mercury is really sort of fascinating. So Billy has Pluto at 15 Sagittarius and Venus at 20 Sagittarius. She also had, we talked about earlier, she had the moon at 12 Aquarius and Neptune at 7 Aquarius. So in both cases, you've got something very significant here that's five degrees apart. When you look at spatial relationships between planets will often manifest in the time of so you're, you're doing progressions or people, you, there's an evolutionary speed with that astrology. You can often see the time mechanism in these spatial relationships. So I would venture to say, just looking at this, Billy Eilish probably has something significant to happen with time. But Billy's Pluto is at 15 side, and her Venus is at 20 side. Frank's Mercury is at 17 side, and his Sun is 19 side. So you've got all this. His Billy's Mercury is at four Capricorn which opposes his natal Pluto, but he's also got something else. His Neptune is at 2 Leo, so that forms a clinical with her Mercury. So you've got a lot of Neptunian kind of vibe here, too, So, uh, which makes us look at Pisces. Well, Frank has a square between Sun and Mercury at 19 and 17 Sagittarius and Jupiter Chiron, at 19 and 18 degrees ice. So, so to me, Neptune becomes super significant in the way in which we might look at them. So we could say there's a sort of a 12th house vibe to them and their relationship with one another. And the other thing, that, the last thing I want to say is that Saturn, Saturn tends to get a bad rap on astrology, right? Frank's Venus is 11 Capricorn. That makes a quincunx with Billy Saturn at 10 Gemini. And her Jupiter is 12 Cancer, so that opposes his Venus. But Frank's Saturn is 14 Cancer, so they have a conjunction between uh, Jupiter and Saturn. There's just a bunch of stuff. I mean, if we could continue, I mean, I. There's just tons of things between the two of them. And there's a there's a solar eclipse that's going to be opposing a solar eclipse at 19 and change um, Gemini in June. So I would expect stuff with both of them this year, just based on yeah, the and you know, so the, that's the gonna zodiac. that's going to hit her Venus. And her Pluto. Right. So there could be a relationship issue that comes up. It could be all sorts of things. Sure. And it's going to hit I would expect... Frank's son. So who knows? Uh-huh. Well, new releases, re-releases of his recordings. We'll see. Um, the The final thing, and uh, I, I just want to touch on this because we could talk for an hour and a half or two about this next topic. And without revealing the actual personalities, unless, of course, you want to. Um, but I, you yourself have been, the whole time I have known you, trying out dating all kinds of possible past lives. And it feels like you have recently honed in on something that has made a lot of things make sense. So if you could just kind of talk in generalities about that. So... If that's... 
So as a child, I'm going to say this real quickly, as a child, I had a lot of visions of things, which I ultimately figured out was Germany, visions from Germany, Germany in the 1930s and 1940s, Hitler, Germany. And so this confused me. It was super, like the imagery was intense, super intense. As a, and, and in some sense, I became very attuned to any sort of neo-Nazi kind of behavior. I was very anti-Semitism would always trip me out. A lot of things, I was very attuned to this time period. I didn't know what it meant. And so I cried and I kept thinking I had been somebody who was connected to this period, somebody who had some sort of like connection to like, the major players didn't know who that would, who that would be. Thought that you know I looked for actresses from the next film business. And I went through all these different and I test drove five or six different people. And I would look at them and it kind of looked like me and it sort of fit, but they didn't really fit. And I was trying to square peg something into a round hole. And then I began to think, and I try to speed this up. I began to think. This had to have been someone who was young, probably the child of somebody who had been sort of prominent in the yeah, not kind of thing So I began thinking about that, and I found someone, and I did her pictures. You've seen the pictures. The pictures yep. Freaky, 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 freaky. So that girl is Helga Goebbels. So as a child, Helga Goebbels, for those of you who may not know what I'm talking about, Joseph Goebbels was a very, he was the head of propaganda for the Nazi party, like one of Hitler's closest confederates. And he, had, he and his wife had six children. Eight, and they murdered all six of their children because they couldn't imagine living in a world without Hitler. So all these children were murdered by their mother. Uh, at, the, at the end of World War II. So having this pervasive, and I and I had said for years and years, whenever I find this German, there's going to be an incredible trauma, and you, you witnessed part of this, you know, an incredible trauma associated with whoever this turns out to be. And uh, I mean, there's more to it, I mean, that's really good. but I do think that this is the past life. And I think it makes a lot of sense in relationship to the things that I had been looking for and had published about what I was looking for all throughout. And I think, so this raises an interesting question. Why would a normal person, using sort of loosely myself, <laughs> why would they, golden boy, you know, jock, pretty boy, all that stuff, why would they just basically donate their life try to find past lives if there wasn't some PTSD type of thing behind it. And I think that this experience, and I do think that in my way of looking at it, this is like true, that perhaps that would make sense why someone would devote so much energy in trying to understand it. As, as an outgrowth of that, it helped me to really understand trauma with, with my children, because as a psychic, I mean, that's most of my, most of my practice is, is people who are dealing with some sort of trauma and trying to figure it out and, you know, move forward. But yeah, so that, the hell of girls. And it gets, there's even funkier parts to it, but I'm going to, you know, bore everybody with that. But, and it took me a long time, I will say this real quick. It took me a long time to go work through the layers of the trauma in order that I might be able to see what was there. So for somebody else, I don't have that. I can get a vision of them. I see it just like a movie. It's just like a silent movie in my head. I watch it. I try to figure it out. I say it's this, this, and this. And I look and see if I find somebody that fits it. We're done. But this is a psychological evolution. This was much more complex for me. And as a result of that, then, again, what you're looking for is kind of a tapestry here, right? You're looking for patterns. So the astrology gives us an indication of patterning between two different people. But 
in my opinion, reincarnation, I believe everybody reincarnates. I think everybody reincarnates a lot, and so there have to be other people. I did those types of celebrity things really as a way of saying, uh, of getting people's attention to try to look at the process and the biometrics and the astrology. But in terms of a person trying to do evolve, I think you have to look at the emotional impact that they bring. And this has an emotional impact. And it was a catalyst for me to do a lot of stuff. And, and this leads me to one of your books. You have several. You do have a book about sexual trauma, right? Yes. Uh, Frozen Butterfly is the last book I wrote. Um, sexual abuse and the impact of sexual abuse is so pervasive. It is unbelievable what it does to people, how common it is, the impact that it has on people, and the ways in which they deal with relationships moving forward, the ways in which they deal with self-esteem. And so to me, it is the issue. Uh, and so I wrote a book called Frozen Butterfly, looking at you know how I think that manifests from my vantage point. Before I was a professional psychic, the idea of sexual abuse was really economy. I was 32 when I first I'm 66. But once I started, it didn't take me long to realize that everybody I talked to, this was the truth. And I think we don't really honor that process much more common with women than men. And, and I think we need to really try to help people move through this and look at ways in which they can understand themselves. Because often, and I wrote another book called Stuck My Roots Doctor, which is about black sheep, and the black sheep, part of it, they're all connected. Because people, women who are abused, are typically taught that what happened to them didn't happen that way. So their cognitive framework is distorted right at the beginning. This is another problem that comes from children who've been sexually verbally abused. They're taught that what happened to them didn't happen that way. So there's an element of confusion and also an element of disassociation in, in terms of I, I suspect it, a lot of people, yeah, a lot of people can um, identify with this. And where do people find these books? Oh, they're on Amazon. Those books are on Amazon. Sure. Okay. Okay. And they're easy. You have, uh, well, what are, what are some of your other ones, other titles that are out there? I wrote a book called Karmic Outlaw, Past Life in the Fast Lane, about another past life as a race driver, Healy Bardsey. Pictures of that are kind of freaky. I've written a bunch of books. I wrote a, I've written three recently, and I wrote seven a long time ago. Um, the Metaphoric Mirror is probably the one that got the most attention at the time. But, uh, but I wrote Stuck My Roots Background, basically <laughs> because of what I saw in, in the uh, – Psychic world, love and light community with QAnon and all the rest of it. This was my rebuttal to QAnon, if nothing else. And, uh, I, you know, love and light game, and this is where that book came. And, and I had a lot of material over the years about sexual trauma. So, um, two cons. And, and we, don't, we don't really recognize what it does to people. And I, and I think it ties into my past life with a girl uh, mm -hmm. related. So finding, you know, it seems strange why I had this affinity for issues with women, uh, but I think because I have these five memories of these women, you know, mm -hmm. they, they kind of blend. But try to find a way to integrate them. And remind people again where they can find information about you. Uh, Andrew, A-N-D-R-E-W hyphen B-R-E-W-E-R dot -E -E com. Me. That's you. Okay, well, well, that's my this... website. But yes, me. Yes. <laughs> this has been absolutely fascinating. Thanks for just going wherever the conversation was going to lead us. Um, I had forgotten about some of those books, and uh, you're a strong advocate for. Uh, an unflinching advocate for all of this. And that's, yeah, I always so find it fascinating. 
definitely a bold voice in whatever ways in which I'm a bold voice. I long ago I used to always be introduced as the most controversial psychic in the world. I thought that was a good experience, but that's where it is. I just <laughs> don't think that people should be bullied. I'm not afraid to say that you could be bullied. And everything else is an outgrowth of that. Well, I really appreciate your coming on today and um Thank you. Go, go check them out, people, andrew-brewer.com, and my forecasts and information are all at empowermentunlimited.net, and my written forecasts are also double-published at Om Times. So uh, strap in. May is going to be quite the interesting ride, and um, I'll see all of you guys in a couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> 